So the conventional wisdom in the United States would, would have it that the U.S. is close to energy independence, largely thanks to the so-called shale revolution. The thinking is that gas will, shale gas will be abundant and cheap for the foreseeable future. Prices below about 450,000 uh, cubic feet for the next decade and below six for the next two decades. The thought is that shale gas can replace substantial amounts of oil for transportation, LNG fuel trucks, residential gas vehicles. There's so much gas in the U.S. we can afford to export to LNG to cap as LNG to capture higher prices in Europe and Asia. Tight oil will allow the U.S. production to exceed that of Saudi Arabia. And U.S. oil imports will shrink to zero. The U.S. is now the, the largest oil importer on the planet. That thinking has also been uh, carried to, to Europe and also to Asia in terms of a growing cheap supply of gas for the foreseeable future. Next slide. This is the latest forecast of gas supply in the U.S. produced by the Energy Information Administration. And as you can see, the traditional sources of gas supply are flat or declining. Uh, the real growth is shale gas, 55% growth by 2040, and half of production in 2040 will be shale gas. Uh, at which time, 12% of U.S. production will be exported. Next slide. The thinking is that this is the, the price of gas, history and projections. And you can see that the price of gas in Japan, for example, LNG uh, imports is about $18. Russian gas in Europe is around 12 to, to 13. Gas in the US right now is about $4, so there's a huge discrepancy thanks to shale. The green line on the bottom is really the projection of, of price by the BIA. And the upper uh, blue line is a projection of supply. So, uh, abundant supply at low prices, that's the, uh, the mantra. Next slide. In fact, the U.S. is still a significant importer of gas, mainly from Canada, but also a, a small amount of LNG. Next slide. This is a, a map of distribution of shale plays in the United States. And you can see uh, it covers a lot of the area. Uh, another myth, if you like, is that, that shale plays are, are ubiquitous. And uh, we can get high, high levels of production pretty much anywhere. Next slide. Shale is really a, a, a function of two technologies, horizontal drilling and large-scale uh, multi-stage hydraulic fraction. And this is just uh, an illustration of how important that technology is. 93% of, of the Barnett shale production is, is horizontal wells. Uh, whereas back just a decade ago, it was uh, almost no horizontal wells. So the technology is incredibly important. Next slide. And you can see, this is the proportion of, of horizontal wells uh, over time. A decade ago, one out of 10 wells was horizontal. Today, two out of three wells are horizontal. So that technology is being applied to, to shale, but also to other unconventional, and even conventional kinds of wells. This is the one estimate of price by shale plant. And you can see that the cost of fuel production varies by play. But in general, if you look at the, the light blue column, most shale gas production in the U.S. is not economic. If you look at the mean, the mean price. There's also quite a range in, in price within plays. The best 20% of, of, the, of the wells that play typically are economic at today's prices. The worst 20% Require very high prices, twelve to fourteen dollars. Next slide. And if you consider those prices, uh, 
The fact of the matter is that much shale gas is not economic. And therefore, we've seen a huge uh, diversion of, of gas drilling to oil drilling. So those rigs are, are now being deployed, looking at, at tight oil and other oil plants, considering the price of oil is quite high. And the gas rig count is at the lowest level since the 1990s. Next slide. Despite the hype of ever growing gas supply in the US, this is the most recent US gas production, and we can see that because of the, the lack of economics in some of those shale plays, US gas supply has plateaued in the last six months. Next slide. This is the growth trajectory of shale plays uh, from almost nothing a decade ago to about 40% of of U.S. supply at present, so that technology and shield really has been a game changer. Uh, the question is how sustainable is it? Next one. This is the last 12 month shale gas production mm -hmm. in, in mid 2012, and it has essentially been on a plateau uh, since about late 2011. Next one. In my report, I looked at 30 different shale gas plays. And it turns out that the top five shale plays produce 80% of the gas, and the top six, 88%. So shale plays are not ubiquitous. There's a few high quality plays, and then there's, there's all the rest. Next slide. <coughs> this is one of the very important points. It may be somewhat unique to the US, given the way that oil and gas is carried out. Uh, typically, a play is discovered. Uh, the news gets out, it's followed by a lease of plenty. The leases require drilling in order to be held. It's typically drilling within three to five years. So a drilling move follows a leasing frenzy in order to, to hold those leases. Sweet spots are targeted in that initial <coughs> drilling boom, and the drilling effort is focused on the sweet spots. The gas production rises very quickly, which is what we've seen. And even if the well, wells are not necessarily economic, if you drill it from scratch, uh, they're often produced to maintain cash flow, despite the economic use of the cost. The sweet spots become saturated, it's really nice to move out of those sweet spots. Well quality declines and fill production declines. Plays like, plays like the Hainesville, which is the number one shale play in the U.S. a year ago, become middle-aged after just five years. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is look at the top three shale plays in the U.S. just to give you an idea of what's going on. This is the Hainesville, which is, I said was the number one. The black wells are, are the top 20% of the highest producing wells. You can see that they're concentrated in a relatively small part of the planet. Next slide. If we look at production in Hainesville, we can see that the peak uh, in late 2011, uh, even though the well count, which is in red here, uh, kept going up. Next slide. And one of the reasons for that is the, the very steep decline in production from individual wells and for the play as a whole. This is a type of decline curve for the Hainesville. First year decline is 66%, followed by fairly steep declines in the second, third, and fourth year. Typically, the declines flatten out over time. But at the end of four years, these wells are down 90 to 95%. So you have to keep drilling. Next slide. This is a measure of overall field decline. And you can see that this is really what would happen if you didn't drill well in 2012. So this is the, the decline of all of the pre-2012 wells, about 47% per year. So 47% of production has to be replaced by more drilling each year. Next slide. The average 
well production from the Innsville peaked in early 2010. It's now down about 30% uh, below peak, even with increased drilling. Uh, next slide. The black point here is the amount of production added to the field per well per year. And the red line is the number of wells added per year. And you can see that right about 500 wells being added per year, that's not 